So, John, what's your favourite childhood movie based on dementia? How do you narrow it down? There's so many. Hmm. Up, maybe? Yeah, I was going to go with Finding Nemo, but sure. Ah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call that it. No, oh, fine. That's, yeah. that's passable. Yeah. Some films are fine, just the way they are. Welcome everybody to Beyond the Box Set, a podcast where we pitch prequels, sequels and spin-offs to films that don't have any. I'm Harry, joining me as always is John. Hello. And we have a guest episode this week. It is the wonderful Phil Hepworth. Hello. Phil, you've been on this podcast before. You know, in all, fi- all 50 episodes. Yeah, yeah, I get about a bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Phil, in fact, wrote and recorded our fabulous theme song, which we get a lot of compliments on, so... Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not forgetting that YouTube is on it as well. Yes, indeed. We are on backing vocals, if you listen mm-hmm. very carefully. Heavily auto-tuned backing vocals. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think Harry is on the left and John is on the right, or mm. vice versa. I think, I think it's definitely all relative, but I think I remember I was more comfortable on the high bits and Harry was more comfortable on the low bits. So. Although I do think we both tried both. Uh, oh yeah, we both did both. Yeah, I yeah. had snippets of both. I can't remember which I used which. I'll uh, extract the... Um, the recordings of both of you and send them to you. Please, please, please delete those files. Oh, God. Minus auto tune. Okay. Uh, oh no. <laughs> Guns ahead. If you had to offer one of us a record deal, which one would you choose? Uh, probably me, to be honest. No, no, one of us. Two. <laughs> what, 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 you what, one? Um, Harry, because he plays trombone as well. Yes. Like, damn it. Yes. I feel like I could be like an outsider artist, though. Like you know, what kind of singers like just speak sing all the time? I, I could be like a pet shop boy. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, he basically speaks the whole time. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Maybe the pet shop boy who doesn't speak. The other one is just is it Clowers in the background with like a backwards cap I on. I don't know much about the Pet Shop Boys. Well, I know Harry's a big fan. You can name so many Pet Shop Boys songs, right? Dozens, so easily. West End Girls? Nice. Well, there you go, you got one. Go uh, West, you must know Go, go West. west. Yeah. What's their obsession with West? I don't know. They're very <laughs> anti-communist. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> oh, I could swear there was another one. Nope. Now that's it, they've just got the two, right? They have many more. Uh, always on my mind, you covered that. No. Oh, that's a tune. Heart. We can't just have a podcast of me listing Pet Shop Boys singles. Um, that's, yeah, that's not our show. <laughs> let's, let's move a lot, yeah. We'll save that for my uh, Pet Shop Boys podcast, which is yeah. coming on soon. A, on a related note, I have a minor announcement to make. Oh, please do, yeah. I'm excited to it. Uh, one of my friends, Joe, Joe Montague, is doing a free drum sessions January. Okay. Where you can send whatever songs you want to him, and he'll put live drums on them for free. Oh, wow. So I sent Beyond the Box set theme tune to him. Oh. So we're going to get some real drums rather than the crappy processed ones ah, that I've got on. And I might uh, treat it with some re-recorded guitars as well, so it sounds a bit more... Bit of an upgrade. A bit more in your face, hopefully a bit, a bit more punky drum-wise. Than you're on the box set 2.0. Exactly, yeah. Oh, okay, so how really? long is it before we can listen to that? Not a clue. He's got quite a lot of um, things sent to him, including some from America. Okay, cool. Well, it's free drums are sought after, I suppose. Yeah. Well, at some point in the near future, we will have a remixed theme tune, which is great. Yep. So thank you, Phil. That's fantastic. Yeah, that was yeah, my announcement. Something. I hope you're not disappointed by it. Not at all. That, no, it, it directly benefits us. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> they thought I was going to get, what, married? I thought you were going to get married to you. I, I guess you were pregnant. Yeah. 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 You're looking heavy right now. So. Yeah, yeah, well, that's all the pizza John just Cool. Okay, so you're not just on here to, to plug your music career, though. We are also here because, you know, yeah, like all guests, you brought a film. So tell us what film you brought for us this I week. bought the wonderful film Batteries Not Included. Mm, the 80s classic. 1987. Mm-hmm. So the tell me, I was born. why did you choose this film? Um, why did I choose this film? I struggled to find one, to be honest. And I don't really know why it came to me. But it's a film I always loved when I was a kid. Mm. And I haven't seen it since I was about 12. Mm. So I thought it'd be quite funny to rewatch it. Uh, I wasn't really 100% confident on how good sequels or prequels could be, but I thought it would be quite funny because it is a weird film. It certainly is. Harry, what did you have, you have you ever seen this before? No, never before. Had you heard of it before? Uh, I think I'd maybe heard of the phrase, so maybe I thought I'd heard of it. I don't know. Sure, yeah. Too um, young. Hmm. Definitely. I really enjoyed it. It takes a bit to get going, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, because you don't really... Well, the big sci-fi element doesn't come in until... But, Half an hour in. Yeah, I checked. It's 25 minutes before you even see the aliens. Yeah. And they're not mentioned beforehand, so it's, there's no build-up. It's yeah, just like... It's weird, because they really set the scene already of what the story is going to be, and then 
And then there's aliens. Yeah, for the first 25 minutes, this is just a very gentle, kind of tragic movie about a woman suffering severe dementia and how her yeah. husband are dealing with it in this yeah. broken down neighbourhood. Mm. So, Yay, kids. Yay. <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> I, like, I, I be happy. was thinking any kids watching this would be way too bored before it actually gets interesting. Mm. I remember being saddened by the film, but not really knowing why. Mm. Yeah, it does have kind of a melancholy kind of vibe, doesn't it? Yeah. The one scene that really stuck with me from when I was a kid is the scene where the babies are born. And there's the one baby who, the baby robot, oh, yeah. who is mm. apparently is still born. Mm. And the guy, Harry, not you, the character Harry, the big boxer guy, says, batteries not included, very yeah. sadly. And that's the, that was my the only scene I really remembered strongly. I just remember the, that whole scene. Is that his first line? Yes. It's weird that he doesn't speak, and that's one of the things that he says. It's a weird thing for somebody who doesn't speak very much to suddenly yeah. come out and say that. Do you know why? Because it's the title of the movie. Because he only can speak in adverts. I, I did pick that up, yeah. Every ah. line he says is some kind of slogan, yeah. Some kind of 80s advert. Maybe not adverts, but it's things from mm-hmm. things he's seen on TV. They're all slogans, yeah. I think you're led to believe he's got brain damage from being a boxer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure. a lot of TV, which he was doing at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Batter is not included. You did that. We bring good things to life. I'll take door number one. You are a genius, Harry, 100%. Don't leave home without it. But yeah, watching it back, I agree. I really did enjoy this film. It's quite a slow-moving film. It tells quite a small kind of story. It's quite low stakes, really. There's not really a lot that happens. So it's basically a very quick recap of the plot is that this film stars Jessica Tandy and Hume Crone. I may be mispronouncing that. Uh, who are an elderly couple living in Manhattan in America in an incredibly run-down building in an area that's being renovated. And so it's, it's just the, it's one dilapidated building surrounded by just rubble, basically. And they own a very run-down diner in this building that appears to have no customers, mm-hmm. apart from the people who are trying to demolish the buildings around them. Who... Well, they're not even the customers. They just really want to have like a sandwich or something. Yeah, and he keeps turning them down, yeah. which I feel like not really in position to turn down trade right now. It's like... No, he needs the business to be successful so that he can justify staying there. <laughs> yes, exactly. If the business fails, then they're just going to be like, well, move on. Yeah. I have no idea where their money is coming from. I mean, not that they seem yeah. to, to be wealthy, obviously, but... How they're making any money whatsoever was baffling to me because they, they legit- own the building as well. Possibly the they must have. It must have been like a rent control. Because someone must have owned it because they all lived there. Like who were they giving rent to? I, I assumed it was the old couple. True. Well, they're, the, the basically the company wants to knock them down and rebuild something. Are trying to pay all of the remaining tenants to, to move out, yeah. uh, and they refuse to because it takes their home. And so it's those two, and then there's also. A man who looks like a cross between Harry, R. Harry, and a hipster Michael Douglas, and um, <laughs> who's an <Yeah>. artist. <laughs> what was his name? His, uh, I can't remember. Mason. Mason, Mason, yeah. Mason. A very 80, a very 80s artsy name. Uh, and then there's a, Latina, there's a Latina lady who's pregnant called Marissa, I believe. And is that everyone? Uh, there's Harry, there's Frank and Faye. The oh, and there's, couple. oh yeah, there's Harry, the, the ex-boxer. Who's yeah. This, yeah. Um, yeah. So they're all living in this building. Yeah, they're all the... Yeah, residents. and some kind of property developer is trying to force them out by throwing money at them and destroying all the buildings. Mr. Around. Lacey. Mr. Lacey, a yeah, classic 80s business villain. <laughs> um, and he also is hiring a bunch of local thugs to come around and intimidate them, mm-hmm. basically. But they're refusing and refusing. Also, the old lady played by Jessica Tandy, I think she's called Faye. Uh, Faye. She's suffering from severe... She appears to be suffering from quite severe dementia. She's just completely away with the fairies. She's you know living in her own world. Don't forget the other two people who used to work in the diner who... Leave early. Yeah, there's another old couple who leave in their first scene. Yeah, got oh, their friends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's just these, for the first half hour. It's just these two old people kind of struggling to kind of get by from day to day. The husband looking after the wife, you know, resisting the pressure to move out. The head of the Latina gang, this guy called Carlos, who's an angry, angry young man. Um, That's a Latino yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> constant Best dress yeah. sense ever. <laughs> His outfits. Yeah. yeah, blew my mind. Yeah, so he's constantly threatening them, he's constantly like vandalising their building, etc. It's just them dealing with this. And then halfway through the film, kind of out of nowhere, some tiny little spaceships appear, and then kind of just, they, they fix everything. They literally fix like items, they fix up the diner, they help to renovate it, etc. And they kind of help them to turn things around. It's the scene after Frank says, like, dear God, I need help, or something. Yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's kind of a make-a-wish. Yeah. And it's like, 
Christmas, mm. the night before Christmas, and magic happens, and it's mm. all very good after that. Yeah, it does have a very magical vibe because at no point does it ever explain where they come from or what they are. They just kind of appear, kind of help them out, and that's kind of it. And then the film's just them, these two little robot spaceships, kind of helping them out. And then they have some children, some some baby robots. They make some baby robots, and then they. Is it weird curious. that they have sex as well? Yes, I found that strange. And especially that the old lady got such a joy out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and that she knew that's what was happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, she's seen very astute on that particular yeah. thing. Like, she's she very be, aware. She thought that a violent Latina gang leader was her dead son throughout the whole film. Mm. And yet when two alien spaceship things start making buzzing noises, she's like, well, well, clearly they're having sex. What do you think they're doing? What are they doing? Can't you tell? She's going to get hungry. Why, why include it? Well, <laughs> there were a lot of elements of this film that led me back to a question we ask a lot, which is, who was this film for? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't heard that for a while. <laughs> no, because it is, I mean, we saw it as children, and it mm. is a children's film. It does have a very magical kind of, I would describe this film as whimsical, that's the word I wrote down. It's a very whimsical mm. film. But it does have a few, like, it does touch on some quite adult themes, because obviously there's the, the dementia thing. I mean, the, there are no children in this film. The lead characters are literally the old man and the woman, which is yeah. very unusual. I quite like that. I, I liked it too. But it's not, not very many films you watch where no. the main characters are an old couple. Absolutely. And I think it's nice, but I just think it's not the common thing. No. Um, but yeah, and there's also, there are a few little references to kind of sex, and there's just adult themes, like because obviously the robots have sex. Violence? There's, there's quite a lot of yeah. stronger violence than you'd quite think. Quite a lot yeah. of violence. And also there's the scene where Mason, the hipster Michael Douglas, paints the woman nude. Yeah. And you see like... Yeah. Like, <laughs> Which is completely inappropriate. It's terrible. He's, he's such a yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was stealing his paintings and creating a strange shrine to him. So I think they were both pretty messed up. So, but yeah. Yeah, that was really weird. Yeah. And I remember being not that weirded out by it when I was a kid. But when I watched it, I was like, is that okay? Mm. Of course that's not okay. That's weird. Yeah, watching it now, it's much more, yeah, that's really not okay. You cross some lines It starts with Carlos, like, grabbing her legs and looking up her skirt and stuff. Mm. Like, she's molested throughout the whole film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Other than by the robots. Yes. <laughs> they but just I... molest each other. Mm. Did she ever break up with her boyfriend? At any point in this film? It was unclear, yeah. I think the, the implication was that he's kind of an absentee boyfriend. Yeah. He's, he's a musician. Yeah, well, he's yeah. horrible musicians. Yeah, he's awful, evil musicians, yeah. But, oh, yeah, so I think that the implication was that when she gave him his bless, her blessing to go on this tour of Chicago or whatever it was he got, mm. that they were breaking up. Either that or she's just decided, well, you know what, if you're going to go away, I'm going to cheat on you with this hipster Michael Douglas guy, so, yeah. He was probably cheating on her when he was away, to be honest. It, yeah, again, it seemed like she was very much an abandoned. Is that what you guys yeah. do? Uh, yeah, all of us. Yeah. yeah. All musicians, all of them. Girl in every port. Cheating bastards. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> That's Damn. why. Well, if there's any consolation, <laughs> back home, your girlfriends are just doing the same. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's the thing. Where's Hector and the All Stars, huh? On their way to Chicago. Oh, that son of a bitch. Look, he got a good job. It's good pay. It's a break, really. Yeah, but what about you? I, um, I told him to go. Well, you need somebody to draw, right? When I read about this film, though, I I learned some things that made me connect some dots about why it is the way it is and why its tone is so unique, because this film was written by Brad Bird, who now works Mm -hmm. at Pixar and Mm -hmm. has written, since written The Incredibles and Ratatouille and worked on a lot of the other ones as well. So I think this, even though it's not an animation, would you agree that this film has a Pixar-y vibe in that kind of, the storytelling? Yeah, I'd say it does. Yeah. Yeah, Pixar do generally, they, they pick a, a kind of character who's different to the norm. Mm. And they've done it definitely in this one with picking two old characters as their main characters and talking about real life issues, like showing what an old woman with dementia looks like, mm-hmm. which is quite educational to children, I yeah. would guess, if children are watching this. Mm-hmm. And the, the sex thing, maybe. No. Cause maybe some mm. kids know that something happens yeah. and then people get pregnant and yeah. have kids. Or robots spit out adorable baby robots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because also, just put it out there, if a real baby is born not breathing or stillborn or whatever, I don't think you should throw it into a bath with an electric toaster. I don't think that's going to help matters. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's definitely, or flush it down that's the definitely how you restart robots. Though. Yes, sure. Yeah. If your laptop's broken, throw it in a sink with a toaster and it'll magically start working. Please not, not kill off our listenership. Is a robot. Yeah. 
But yeah, I thought that was stupid. Yes. <laughs> and yet it worked. It worked. Yeah, obviously he'd have the scientific know-how how to fix one of these robots in the first place with a soldering iron and a screwdriver. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially when, what's his face, um, Mason looks inside it with a magnifying glass. Mm. And there are loads of little things flying around inside it. It looks like it's a small spaceship with tiny, it tiny little life forms like running it. like Independence Day spaceship it on did, the inside. It? Yeah. That's what I thought it was. Yeah. Well, that was, I was going to ask that. What do you think they were? Well, I guess they were beings. Yeah. Because like, they had eyes and mm-hmm. mouth and stuff. No, um, AI, though. Maybe. Who made them? I don't know. Well, they make themselves, don't they? But who, who made the who, first who's, one? Who, yeah, who made the first one? Maybe they evolved. So the chicken or maybe egg. They, maybe they made themselves. Maybe they took the consciousness of, of their previous organic selves and put them in these robotic bodies, and now they just mm-hmm. uh, reproduce that way. Like Daleks. Maybe it's a future version of humanity. Maybe someone's going to talk about this on their sequel. <laughs> So guess your sequel. No, not Good. necessarily. So we'll <laughs> no. see. I can do three weeks running. Three weeks in a row. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it does, it does, it, it it does keep it quite ambiguous. And you're right. When they look inside of it, it, does look look like it could just be a very tiny spaceship that's just populated by little tiny pixely people. Mm. So yeah, it's unclear. It is, it's an interesting design. This kind of is it a robot or is it an alien kind of thing. And again, the, and the I, film makes no effort to answer that. And I was wondering, were the, were the little ones, were they going to grow up? Like, were they going to get bigger? I wondered that too. Over time? Well, it seems Cause, like... Because they, they, like, they all had different themselves. functionalities. Like, one of them had the extendy arms that he could catch onto things with. <laughs> one of them had a little propeller helmet thing. Why did they all have different ways of one getting One had around? a hand so it could slap One just did a massive bitch slap. For no reason. <laughs> just like, one, like, it then ejected the hand as well. Like, it's just a one-time thing. Mm. I don't need this, but... And then the guy with Mason was like, hey, that's my t- t- can opener. Like, yeah. <laughs> it did seem it was very Inspector gadget It was like, whatever they needed, they had that functionality at that moment. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I enjoyed the scene. The, the scene with the mother robot is teaching them how to fly by pushing, like birds do, like pushing mm-hmm. rocky oh, yeah. sill. And as you say, one of them develops little hands and mm. grabs onto the banister. And she pulls out a, a saw. Like a, <laughs> I thought she's going to saw the hands off. Same, same, same. I was, I was, I was like, oh my God, that is brutal. <laughs> <laughs> Could, could have just like flicked his hands off. Yeah, exactly. Rather than bothering to cut yeah. like but the half way it, the stairwell off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the way it's shot is very much you can't see that she's cutting into the wood until it floors. Oh god, she's not a monster then. But yeah, it's very odd. The plot really hinges on this. The old couple in particular, but also the other residents, like not wanting to move out of this building. Yeah. Even though they were offered money to leave. I, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I, I kind of felt like if it was me, that it would be a short movie. If I was living in that area in that building, I would take the money and run. Would you? Yeah, but I think the stories they lived there all their life and they've built up their reputation of well clearly it's, they, not it's clearly not there for anymore. Business, yeah. <laughs> but um the opening scene when it's all in black and white and hmm. lots of old photographs which apparently were actually photographs of the actor and actresses when they were younger because yeah because they're, they're married, married yes yeah. yeah so it's like you've lived there all your life get out and mm-hmm. they're saying no, I don't want to get out yeah. maybe it's just the time we're living in politically right now but I have very limited patience in my life right now for all people who are afraid of change <laughs> fair enough <laughs> so I was like just fucking take the money fair <laughs> would you like to live in that place at the very end when it's been renovated yeah when it's been renovated and they've built up the area and it's all looking very nice would you want to live there then no because it's still like a wasteland like it's a great building in the middle of a wasteland it's not like they built a whole town around it well no like when they built skyscrapers and stuff around it I mean oh when it's been gentrified yeah well, maybe, but not necessarily in that particular building. Like, I thought it looked nice. Okay. That'd be cool. Just like, where do you live? The tiny building surrounded by giant buildings. No. Like, the one in the middle of the Empire State Building. That's, well, actually, that, that's no, me. I wouldn't want to live there. I want, because that's not a residential area anymore. It's like the worst. It's, 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 it is gentrification. It would like be the cool, only people cool to live there for a while, but you want to live there for a long time, wouldn't you? No, Especially yeah. if you're older. Yeah. House prices have got up. True, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose you cling <laughs> on to that property, but it's not. <laughs> a lot of uh, expensive, nice coffee shops nearby. I hope that as soon as they finish the skyscrapers, or just got so far that they couldn't change their plans, then the old couple were just like, you know what, actually have it, it's fine. <laughs> well, Mason, just out of spite. Mason, yeah. <laughs> Mason would move out straight away because he's a artsy hipster. Mm. Mm. If he was suddenly living in like a business district, he'd be like, oh, I don't want to live here. I want to go and live somewhere shit. Yeah. So he'd immediately move away to somewhere that was Very a bit true. like how it was before. That's what I mean. It was classic gentrification because the only people living there were the extremely elderly who lived there all their lives and a wanky hipster. What, what were your guys' thoughts on the actual skyscraper itself? Did you guys think it looked better with the massive cut in the middle of it? Yeah, but that's going to reduce the office space by quite a lot. <laughs> they could have built above the house. I know, they could Like a little they? cave for the house rather than removing the whole length of <laughs> the building. Like It just seemed a bit unnecessary. It did look cooler. Mm. There's a scene towards the end where the property developer 
uh, grows tired of the intimidation tactics not working on the old couple and decides to just burn the apartment down. Mm. But he does so in the most ridiculously convoluted way. But with like balloons and stuff. Yeah, he's like, what was he putting in? <laughs> the party balloons. There's yeah. some kind of explosive <laughs> powder inside milk cartons and then he's put a load of balloons up and then like, but like, look around you. You could probably just like breathe too heavily on one of the one of the load bearing walls and it come crashing down. It's like just strike a match. Yeah. It's- what I didn't get about that <clears throat> is before he told him to burn it down, mm. there was a model of the new building mm. with the section taken out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, uh, so, so they, they, they've already taken out. prepared to have the house still there. Yet he's going to bomb it. Like, yeah. <laughs> What, why? <laughs> it doesn't make sense that at all. It was really annoying. Oh, I'm wondering. So the building burnt down to the ground. But then when they came back, everything had been redone and fixed up and the building was looking better than ever. Did all those little robots, did they go up to the, the hipster guy's place and repaint all his paintings? Oh, mm. good point. Was it like they fixed the photograph, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Like, did they have scanned copies of all the paintings already that they could draw from, or did they just sort of guess? They like, just knew how the pieces um, went together before. Well, I guess he's just one of these kind of artists. Let's just do this kind of art. As if they went all the way back, they just turned the whole building into a big block of carbon. <laughs> That's how it was originally. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the, at, the, at the end scene, the one of the property developers says to the other one, um, they're scamming us, it's just a facade. Like, it's literally, they just put up a facade overnight, and I thought, well, actually, maybe that is what's happened. Like, maybe inside, maybe it's like that episode of The Simpsons where the tower comes together to rebuild Ned Flanders' house, and they go inside, and it's just a complete piece of crap from the inside. The robots are all just holding yeah, it up yeah, from behind, yeah. like, are they still there? <laughs> <laughs> or the, the strong and stable house in Arrested Development. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen, like, a montage of the little robots, like, repainting the nude painting of the Latino ladies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the little baby one. Yeah, yeah, the baby's just working on the nipples. Right? Well, no, no, no. I, I, I'd like it if like, one of the adult ones like, reaches out a hand and covers the baby's eyes. Oh, or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, good. Why did they do that? Right. Oh, that'd be good. Uh, did you have a favourite character, anyone particularly? I didn't like any of them. You didn't like them I found at all? Them all really annoying. Okay. And this is your choice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe Frank. The, the, uh, I had a, I had a soft spot for Carlos. Yeah, Carlos. I was, was, was going to say Carlos. He, I mean, he, he was my favourite character. When he rocks up with the flowers and the his most... little shorts on, you're like, yeah. what are you doing? He had, he had the most character development though as well. He had an arc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah. kind of realised that he was a dick mm-hmm. and kind of tried to better it, but it didn't go very well. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. I loved his outfits, all of them. The, 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 so the outfit funny. at the end was the best by far. He's wearing like this bright canary yellow, matching t-shirts and shorts <laughs> as well with the same pattern. But throughout the film, he's wearing. He, he, there's the scene at the beginning where he's like shirtless with that big gold chain and these big like loon pants, and it's just very. Eight, there's a lot of very eighties a really fashion. camp gang. Yes, yeah, they're around with their shirts open. I really felt like at any moment they could burst into a chorus of, Amer- of America from West Side Story. Just start snapping the fingers in a syncopated rhythm. Um, although my favourite outfit was not Carlos. My very favourite outfit was a very throwaway. Very early on, the other woman, you know, there's, there's the married couple who live with them who are slightly less old, who are like mm. supporting them. The scene where they're going away, for no reason, the other old lady is dressed like Super Mario. Mm. <laughs> I did not notice that. <laughs> I know it's that. What was that about? Proper like the hat. She's wearing the overall. Like she's fully wearing like a Super Mario outfit. Like at this point, I didn't know which one was which, and so mm. I thought that she was the one with dementia, and I was like, okay, <laughs> she's just just put on all her fun clothes. Yeah. Well, some of Jessica Tandy's like dementia clothes are pretty fun as well. They were yes. too. She was wearing a lot of floral print, and at the beginning, she's smoking a cigarette attached to another cigarette. I think. Was she? Or was that just an eighties <laughs> cigarette thing? holder? Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. it looked strange to me. But... I did think the acting elevated the film because the main two. It helped that they were really good actors. Like Jessica Tandy. Have you ever seen Driving Miss Daisy? No. Well, she's been in many things, but that's a famous thing she did around the same time. Mm-hmm. Good film. We'll do it one time. Uh, but yeah, they're very, very good. And I found that a lot of the dementia stuff, especially around her son, because there's a whole thing where she keeps mistaking Carlos for her son, Bobby. And it's pretty obvious from the start, but we found out at the end that Bobby is in fact dead and has been dead for some time. And there's some very poignant little scenes oh. where she, when she when she has the moment of realisation, she starts crying. And died, your heart breaks through. He died in a car crash trying to get away from his dad, yeah. Frank. I mean, I thought for a, quite a bit of it, did Frank kill him? Mm. Did Frank, like, push him down the stairs or something? Mm. But no, Frank just drove him away and, well, literally. Yeah. And then he died in his car. Mm. So another dark element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's not included. A really dark, yeah. And then Carlos is, like, trying to get, when the building is burning down and Jessica Tandy is trapped in the building, Carlos finally, after resisting for the entire film, finally tries to 
play along and be yes it's me it's your son Bobby now come follow me down to the car and she's like no not the car like, yeah. it's really dark and then she realises he, realizes he's not Bobby yeah yeah at that point yeah, yeah at that point yeah <laughs> maybe like beats around the head and carries her out like a bear mm, yeah gee whiz mom I'm sorry I I just wanted to show you something show me what my my car yeah gosh don't you remember the new car your car? No. No. Let's go. Don't want to miss the big game. Dad's waiting downstairs, and, and you know how he is. Your father? Yeah. Good old Dad. What a guy. You're not Bobby. You're not Bobby. You're not him. Give me a... Please. Should we get him some drinking games? Sure. Let's. I didn't broke. think about that. <gasps> Phil. But I'm quite creative. Go, go, go. I'll think of something. All right, Phil, go first. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first one I've got is drink whenever the old Tina lady is the only one who actually knows what's going on. Mm, classic, yeah. Which I was scared was going to be the whole film. Yeah. Because <laughs> when, when she is the first person to see them and then she's calling them the little fellas and mm. nobody else knows what she's talking about, I was like, if the whole film's this, I'm out already. <laughs> yeah, that would have been really annoying. Yeah. Mm. But it's just that that's the, yeah she know she seems to just accept the robots as a fact of life. But that's mm. the only thing she really knows about. Other than that, she is just kind of away mm-hmm. with it. But yeah, good one. Uh, I put drink whenever somebody angrily breaks something. Yeah, that does happen. I mean, there's bit. a lot of Carlos Especially just randomly. Start. Yeah, there's a lot of Carlos randomly smashing shit up. But there's also a few scenes when other people do it too. Like every time someone has to express an emotion, they seem to do it by breaking a piece of their own furniture. Mm-hmm. Like there's the scene where I think the old man has some kind of argument with the woman and then he walks into the kitchen and just go, he just flings the family picture just goes, boom, smashes to the ground. Mm. And there's the scene where the old lady misunderstands the context of Carlos being violent and just throws a cup down. And just <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was really funny. <laughs> so, yeah, ang- angry breaking stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, side note, my favourite protest was when Mason gets pissed off that he's been cock-blocked by Latino woman's boyfriend. Oh, yeah. Is it Hector? Gets, get, yeah, by Hector. Gets really pissed and then just comes into the building squawking at everyone like oh, a yeah. bird for some reason <laughs> oh yeah it's like you know, pissed, you know what happens when they... up, wanders up the stairs yes yes he's always there's obviously a side plot that a few cut scenes of him just like in the nearby bar just like downing shots and just like, <laughs> feeling sorry for himself you know what happens when birds learn to fly they leave the nest <laughs> drink every time someone says bobby Bobby, oh yes. That's because that one. happens quite a lot. The name of the Sometimes son, yeah. about five mm. times in one minute. Yeah, <laughs> so that that's, yeah, that's the name of the old couple's deceased son. Mm. He comes up a lot, yeah. Uh, drink whenever the superintendent, it's probably up to the start of the film, just sort of very subtly just appears in the background of the scene without saying anything, as though like he wasn't even supposed to be on set. He just sort of <laughs> appears there and it's like, oh, he's there. Okay. Yeah, that's mine. So I had this exact same thing. Drink whenever Harry just sort of wanders into shot. Yeah. <laughs> And sometimes without so, any lines yeah yeah well he doesn't have any he has like five lines in the whole film and sometimes he'll wander into shot and then he'll be part of the scene in other ways but sometimes he just it's like literally he was late to set aside. yeah yeah <laughs> it's very strange <laughs> yeah I had that one too and the only other one I had which only happened a couple of times but it's always fun for me is a drink for electric shock hair oh, oh I forgot to mention that Carlos's yeah. electric shock hair so good <laughs> yeah because I was disappointed by the lack of wigs in this film because <laughs> I feel like in, uh, yeah, the 80s were hit and miss with wigs most people had so much hair that wigs were kind of irrelevant but I was very pleased with the electric shock hair whether that was wigs or just using what they had mm. they must have been doing a bit to add some more especially with Mason when he gets his electric shock when he comes out looking like a startled lion like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you could drink every time Mason does something really hipster yes that'd be a good one yeah <laughs> Just, just exist. I love that one of his most beloved paintings is of himself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's the worst. Because of the scene where his previous girlfriend, who fact fans, is played by the voice of the wife from American Dad. Ah, okay. Yeah, Wendy Shaw. Um, obviously a very young Wendy Shaw. Yeah, but she says you never once asked to paint me nude, and then obviously that comes back later when he paints the Latin lady of nude. I thought it was a funny line. And then obviously you found that he's much more interested in painting himself. Are any of the other actors in anything after that film? Like um, Carlos or... None of them really struck... No, I didn't recognise any of the names. Like There's some, there's some like character actors. I think the guy who played the property developer was in the, the, the sitcom Mad About You for a while. But no, they made, apart from Jessica Tandy and Hume Curran, who are more, more like stage actors really, but have yeah. been in a lot of famous films, especially Jessica Tandy. She was in, as I say, she was in Driving Miss Daisy and uh, Fried Green Tomatoes around the same time as this. 
I feel like I've seen Harry again in an action film. Are you sure you didn't just see... Oh, you mean Harry, the big black guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah If you were yeah. talking about Mason, I'd be like, were you sitting next to him? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Incidentally, Harry. Yeah. I am known for just painting naked people. Yeah. Without asking. It's starting to get weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been working all, all episode. <laughs> Any more? Or should we move on? Drinking games? No. Okay, well, let's get on some sequels like then, shall we? Some, but... mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, do, you want, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Any preference? Uh, I'll go first. Okay, sure. Get that out of the way. Oh, well, that's a way to build up the anticipation there, Harry. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, this might be a little bit of a quick one, but uh, that's hopefully that's good because there's a guest. So... Battery's not included. Two disc wars. Disc wars. Okay. I haven't got a title. You don't need one if you oh. don't. We can we can brainstorm we, one for you. That's cool. I, cool. I always forget to do a title. It's yeah. fine. In a small town of Heathrow, England, the airport wants to build a third runway. To do so, they're gonna have to demolish the town and remove uh, everybody from their homes. Nice. Okay. I didn't know Heathrow was a town. I'm so bad on English. Not sure, not sure if it is anymore. Okay, right. Okay. Okay. No, it's now now a runway. It used okay. to be a town. Really? Okay. So maybe we're going back in time a little bit. I don't know. Sure, okay. I don't, I don't know. Well, we can set from the past. How long has the third runway been there for? No idea. No, but yes, yeah, so that's the, the, the story of the third runway. Cool. Okay, um, this has a political bent. I like it. Yeah. When the whole town gets threatened of uh, of eviction and then getting demolished, the flying saucers come to rescue again, help everybody out. So they keep fixing everything at night while there's people trying to demolish the buildings and intimidate all the residents. Okay, so every time the property developers knock something down the robots will come in and build it back up again yes that'd be so annoying yeah <laughs> so after a while the company who's contracted to, to do the demolition okay a certain company we might have heard of before oh okay is it Big Daddy? have you listened to many of our other episodes do you know mm. do you know what Big Daddy Corp is no great <laughs> is this something you're inventing or is this something from something my... I have invented Yes. It's uh, one of those big, evil, giant corporations that oh, right. comes up in some films. Well, I might use that in mine. Hey, other people can't I do that. I was going to use a real... Oh, I did consider using Big Daddy in mine as well, actually. I thought, it's your thing, I can't steal Big Daddy. So. I can't all do Big Daddy episodes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so after a while, Big Daddy, who have been contracted for this demolition and then the construction, they catch on to what's happening, and they capture a few of the flying saucers. Okay. Which they, don't know if they torture or something, but they bring them around to their side. Perhaps a bit of Stockholm Syndrome sort of thing. And they make a deal with them, which creates a different faction in the Flying Saucers. So now there's one faction of Flying Saucers who are trying to fix everything, and there's another one who are trying to break everything. Right. Tear, flying tear robot everything down. <laughs> exactly. Ah, uh, yeah. Exactly. So this sparks several sort of years of war above the village of Heathrow. <laughs> <laughs> drone war not the clone wars the drone wars <laughs> the drone wars, the drone wars. <laughs> oh actually not included two attack of the drones attack of the drones perfect yeah. right so several years of war above Heathrow with grand battles of small flying saucers little side plots of spying on both sides and and, it, and even little saucer children that brought up as sleeper agents oh no it gets dark okay it, go, it goes dark oh really meanwhile as this war happens. If there's collateral damage, the entire village of Heathrow gets burnt to the ground. It's irreparable. Okay. It's, it's, it's gone completely. Could it be turned into a runway? The war ends with mass destruction when Big Daddy Corp set off an EMP, destroying all the flying oh, saucers. Oh, no. What's an EMP? Sorry. Electromagnetic pulse. Ah, okay. Two years later, Ooh, okay. the runway is now complete. Mm-hmm. Oh. We see planes taking off, planes landing. Camera pans down into the drain where we see a single broken flying saucer remaining. It twitches slightly and then we cut to black. Oh, okay. Ooh. So, is that it? Yeah, that's okay. it. Are there any human antagonists or protagonists in this? There could be. Like, are the robots, befri- are the robots, robots. befriended an elderly couple? Are, they, are there anyone who's like the symbol for the town wanting to stay together? Or? Well, there could be, but ultimately it ends in loss. So, True. it depends on how sad you want the film to be. I, I'm all for a bleak depressing all right great it's got a very lovable cast okay well who would you who, who would you cast <laughs> well, well the thing is like jessica tandy and hume crone are both understandably now dead mm-hmm. um so who would you cast if you were to like recast that type but maybe british like old so people uh judy walters julie walters sure yeah she'd be good yeah um who else is old who else is old <laughs> patrick stewart patrick stewart judy walters and patrick stewart they're a couple <laughs> right yeah maybe patrick's got dementia this time yeah that makes more sense mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think mean, that works. Did the robots kill the people as well? Well, no, the people all got evicted. But when the when it burns to the ground, the well, people. Oh, yeah, to be fair, yeah, maybe there were some casualties. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe some people did die. Okay. Maybe we see that in all its gory detail. 
Okay. Is Denzel going to make an appearance as the head honcho of Big Daddy, or is it just by proxy? So it's just by proxy. I think that we probably spent all the money on the other cast. Okay. What, well, all the, all the British <laughs> who don't really have anything to do, but all the CGI. Background, yeah. Yeah. Is the CGI good, or is it crap like the original film? I think it would be of its time, no. so of, of, of 2018, time. which would be quite good. Yeah. But when people look back on this film in 20 years, which they will, because it's clearly mm-hmm. a classic, mm-hmm. uh, they'll go, wow, that looks shit. <laughs> Uh, I do think you should have Denzel because I think you should have a scene where especially if an entire town is being burnt to the ground mm-hmm. you need to have a scene where like the town is in flames and you just see like the foot crunching on the gravel and then you just see Denzel just strolling in like with his, mm-hmm. in his glasses and just... oh maybe walking away from an explosion without yes looking. yes he presses the button <laughs> there we go yeah, he's walking away from the explo- from the burning town and he presses the button that sets off the AMP and all of, and everything just goes boom and he doesn't even look no Who's he doesn't, guy he doesn't just... even break his stride who's the guy that films everything blowing up is it Michael Bay. Bay. Yes. yes. Could it be directed yes. by Michael Bay? Yes. Oh, okay. Lots of exploding robots. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, nice. This is a much... get, Sp- get Spielberg out of the way. Yeah, Michael yeah, yeah. Bay. He's the guy. Yeah. This is a much less charming version of the film. <laughs> but I, I can see how it works. Yeah. yeah. That was batteries not included too. Disc Wars. Disc Wars. Or, or Attack of the Drones. Attack of the. I think Attack of the Drones is better. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Love it if the little robot's dad was like one of the Independence Day spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> they all just fly yeah. out of it. That'd be cool. I did think this isn't the idea I went with, and if it's what you've gone with, then by all means stop me. But I did think one of my alternative ideas was to have it like Star Trek or something, where what the actual robot slash aliens are is like exploring spaceships with full crew of people. Mm-hmm. So from who, the point of view of the... Yeah, who just find themselves on this humanoid planet like Star Trek often does, where they just happen to be really, really small. Mm. And, yeah. <laughs> like the borrowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but like that. smaller. Yeah. Well, very good. good. Yeah. That's, uh, that's me done. Cool. All to you, Phil. Okie dokie. Guest always goes in the middle. I had some good ideas. I mean, I had some bad ideas. I've not got a title, so I have to think of a title for me. Um, the Fix-Its, The Little Guys. Well, oh, that's what, that is what they were called, yeah. wasn't it? The Fix-Its, yeah. Well, she called them The Fix-Its and The Little Guys. So. Yeah. One of them. Wikipedia said they were called Fix-Its. Yeah. I said they, they were actually government drones used as a last resort for the upkeep of important secret entrances to US government research facilities. Nice. Okay. So that's what this building is? Yeah. It's uh, government research into alien life and technologies, men in black style. Okay. And Harry is the station keeper, mm-hmm. like the entrance to the secret underground research area. Uh, and he keeps quiet about everything to maintain secrecy, which is why he doesn't speak much. Mm-hmm. The entrance is in his workshop and one of the toilets in the cafe so that people can come in dressed as builders, go into the toilet for a really long poo or something, <laughs> and go down to the research it's a nice facility. Detail, yeah. I think we should have that scene. Just to... Yeah, it's important. A very long poo um, scene. The sequel follows Harry, uh, follows him into the workshop, through the secret door, and down into a sprawling underground complex with lots of fixits flying about all over the place, like, I don't know, delivering letters and having a chat. So does this part stuff. explain how he knows how to fix one? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Right. Well, he did fix it by, like, giving up and lobbing it in a sink or something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a magical sink. Mm-hmm. Who knows? But Harry goes into his manager's office and is told he's reassigned as he's insured the position of the old building in the area because it's still there. Whether he actually did anything to make that happen or not, he's unnecessary because the building's not going to get knocked down. So he gets relocated to the British Alien Research Foundation, or BARF for short, (laughs) which is a crappy pub in London called either the Tixif Tavern, which is Fix It Backwards, or the Little Guy's Tavern. Okay. Up to you. I think I prefer um, the latter, I think. Yeah, yeah although I'd... it does feel like it's some kind of niche sex club for dwarves. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the little guy's tavern. <laughs> you know what to expect. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I'm not saying I have a membership, I'm just saying. Have you seen <laughs> Olympus Has Fallen? Yes. No. I knew you would. What? It's a disaster movie. I love disaster movies. As Fallen is, the White House gets attacked by terrorists and one guy has to sort them out. That's the one. So if you relate that to Batman Not Included, Mm -hmm. and then the sequel to Olympus Has Fallen was... London Has Fallen. London Has Fallen. So it's the same thing in London. Oh, okay. Right, so you know where I'm going. So um, Harry is now the mute pub barman Mm -hmm. in the little guy's tavern. All the actors are Americans doing English accents. Great. Any suggestions who that does might be? No. But there are two actors who are the owners of the pub, mm-hmm. who are an old couple, and they are John Cleese and Prunella Scales. Oh, good. Good choice. Yeah, you know Prunella Scales legit has dementia, so... 
oh, in real life. That's, that's a really. I would say that's perfect. That sounds. A bit well, she's weird. gonna. She might struggle to learn her lines. But, uh... That's fine. Just improv. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Just let it go. Just <laughs> that's fine. Um, they're both still alive, aren't they? They are still alive. Yes. Is Harry still alive? The actor who played Harry, I believe yeah. he is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't Ooh. think any, yeah, the, the two main are, are dead because they were in their nineties when they were doing this, and it's like thirty years ago. So you know. But no, I'm pretty sure everyone else who's a character, the, the other actors are all still alive, as far as cool. I know. Well, they're in a cheap pub mm-hmm. in uh, London or somewhere near London or whatever. But the government is putting up lots of affordable homes in the area under the affordable home scheme. And uh, underneath the dirty old pub is a secret laboratory of, course. of Bath. Okay. Um, <laughs> secret laboratory of Bath sounds <laughs> gross. It's not a nightclub. Yeah. Um, but, like, yeah, the um, affordable homes people, let's call them Gladman, mm-hmm. are uh, trying to, um, yeah, get rid of this crappy pub because no one, all the pubs are closing down and they want to build all these crappy affordable homes. And they do all the usual attacks on the residents and the people that go there trying to scare them out like in the first film and I kind of skipped over a bit and I decided that the pub eventually accidentally gets burnt down during protests about the NHS privatisation sure okay this has got very political um, uh, <laughs> twice this week <laughs> and there'll be loads of other characters kind of related a bit to the first one so the person that's harassing the pub would be a bit like Carlos maybe he could be sure I don't know. Who could he be rather than Carlos? Well, I did. Could I he be one, Irish? He could be, yeah. Well, I did. Well, if he was going to be Irish, um, I was going to say, if you're going to cast Amer- all Americans as, as English actors, oh, that's a good idea. then you definitely need to have Keanu Reeves because he is famously god awful at accent work. Have you ever seen him in Brian Stoker's Dracula? It is one of the funniest British accents I've ever heard. Yeah. I don't think he's ever attended terrible film. Irish, but if he has, I'd like to hear it. I've seen many strange things already. Bloody wolves chasing me through some blue inferno. Another abandoned idea I kind of thought about and then dropped that you maybe you could incorporate into yours if you want to was remaking it with the cast of Space, which is something we've done a few times before. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good and idea. And so if you're going to have like a bunch of quirky yeah, characters in the pub, funny. you could just have it as like the World's End kind of style kind of thing. So have a bit of Simon yeah. Pegg, a bit of Nick Frost. Yeah, that'd be good. They could be, um, well, you could have Simon Pegg as the hipster. Of course. Guy like, oh, yeah, he could be Mason, yeah. And then... Oh, Nick Frost would be a great Harry. Just this looming kind of, you know... <laughs> Yeah, hulking presence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if Harry, whoever played Harry, wasn't up for it, Nick Frost could do it instead. True, yeah, that works. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Harry's the main character in this one, so yeah. So, but yeah, whatever. Like, mm-hmm. Any characters all do as long as yeah. they have uh, embarrassingly bad English accents. Great. <laughs> so the newer, because it's based a bit later, more advanced little guys, fix it people. Mm-hmm. They come along because Harry was sent to look after it, and he's like, "Oh crap, I've fucked it up," because uh, the whole thing got burnt down accidentally by the Irish Carlos or whatever mm-hmm. and they get a bit carried away and they don't only rebuild the pub they rebuild the whole street <laughs> and dismantle all the crappy houses and it becomes like a little old town oh, okay of, so know. are these people are the people already living in these houses are you, are you talking like a really run down kind of council estate kind of thing that suddenly becomes really gentrified again like, yeah. um, I was thinking like the whole area got gradually knocked down and only the pub was left oh okay so it's not people who already are living there it did Buildings are literally being built up yeah. out of nothing. Okay, great. The buildings were built back to how they were before the new houses. Started. Okay, I get it. Yeah, people could move into those rather than the shitty new ones. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. And I kind of stopped there because that would be the end of the film, wouldn't it? Like, okay. oh, look, we've rebuilt it. It's lovely. Yeah. And I'd get Harry to say some advert slogans from these days sure. rather than the 80s. Mm-hmm. So um, does. But I don't really know where to put them. Like, taste the rainbow. Yeah. But I don't know where you can put that. Maybe maybe he, he punches someone. Maybe on his arrival in England, because famously American beer is really crap, like comparatively to English beer, it doesn't taste very good. So he, he gets into England after being reassigned, he strolls into this pub, gets a pint of whatever we, we get a deal with to, to plug, whether it be Strongbow or, I don't know, what's a, what's a British beer or a, a European Strongbow beer? Cider. I know Strongbow Cider, what's a European side beer? Hobgoblin. Hobgoblin, a pint of Hobgoblin. He, t- he takes a swig and he goes, mm, taste the rainbow. Yeah. Well, then what does taste the rainbow promote? What, what? Skittles. Skittles. Or you could just get something with some skills, I guess. Yeah. And the other one I thought was it gives you wings, which is Red Bull. Red Bull, yeah. and like maybe he could fix one of the robots. <gasps> yes, oh, brilliant, um, great. Say that. Or That's something. good. Yeah. Um, so like one of the robots gets in gets injured in some way, much like the first film, yeah, an axe to the head or whatever, and then he just pours a can of Red Bull over it and it just repairs itself. It's like <laughs> it gives you wings. <laughs> and the last one I had is like when someone's trying to set fire to the. Uh, building or something mm-hmm. one of the little tiny fix-its like just hits him on the head with a t- small spoon or something great yeah something really pathetic and he goes 
every little helps. <laughs> and then uh, someone like smacks the back of their ass or something. <laughs> <laughs> the other ones I got were they're great. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> snap mm, because you're worth it. But I didn't know where to put them. Yeah, I think you just say them. Well, I just say the them was, randomly yeah. for no I just, reason. I think just if if he can say maybe it's Maybelline, yes. that'd be great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just try drinking some beer. Maybe it's Maybelline. Yeah. No, no, no it's, Harry. It's, it's, it's beer. Yeah. <laughs> it's wrong with you. If you were drinking Maybelline, you'd be very unwell. <laughs> yeah. Like it. And that was my uh, rather weirdly put together idea. I like it. It's good. Yeah, uh, it did good. we did we get a title of that in the end or no? No. Can you think of one? So. So a remake of the film set in a British pub in an oldie worldy town. Battery's not included Steely. to core blimey, governor. We're, Bri- <laughs> we're British now. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't oh. no batteries in that. Yeah. No. Oh, maybe you could set the whole thing in the fictional town or district of um, Walford and have it... Uh, is, is it Walford? What's the, what's the fake one? The from EastEnders. So oh. Uh, Battery's not included to get out of my pub or, you know, or just EastEnders. <laughs> or just EastEnders like, you know. Where is it in EastEnders? Is it? I think it's called. Is it what? Is it Walford? Because Watford's something a real like, place, isn't it? Something like Walford. I think it's Walford. I'm if not... you could weave some politics in there, you could have batteries not included too better together. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I kind of wanted to make more of either the affordable housing scheme or the NHS thing, but I couldn't be bothered. Yeah. Mm. At some point, Harry gets <laughs> a terrible a injury. Is, yeah. At some point, Harry gets some kind of mildly terrible injury, goes to hospital and walks out going, thank God for the NHS. That would have cost me yeah. a fortune in America. <laughs> he looks direct to camera. <laughs> Protect your NHS. It's just at the end of the film when yeah. they've all been hurt by the yeah. violence. and yeah. they, They're all fine now yeah. because of the NHS. Well, maybe all the little robots, because what their thing is, is to fix things, maybe they can also fix people. So then maybe they all come in to replace all the nurses who get kicked out because of Brexit. Ah. You get an automated kind of hospital situation. Yeah, good idea. Mm. All right. On to me. On to you. Okay. So... My story is neither a prequel nor a sequel. It's kind of a, what I've referred to in previous episodes as a sidequel. Oh, you've not had a sidequel before. I have. So yeah, this is basically the same film, but told from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And that is from the perspective of two characters who play a very small role in this film, who I mentioned earlier, which is the other elderly couple who are the friends of the the old couple who are Jessica Tandy and Hume Curran. So these characters I Wikipedia'd are called uh, Sid and Muriel. (laughs) <laughs> so there you go yeah. good. it's a good couple's name that they are good. Yeah, Muriel's a good old lady name yeah. definitely so yeah so it's about them basically so their characters at the beginning of the film they are shown to be very supportive of would their couple's name be Serial Serial yeah <laughs> I'm not going to be using yeah. that for sure um, <laughs> <laughs> so they're shown at the beginning of the actual film to be neighbours of Faye and Frank the old couple mm-hmm. in the kind of derelict building yeah and they're very supportive of them they help out Frank a lot with Faye's dementia etc but ultimately they leave quite early on because they they take the money that is being offered to them by the property developers and move into a, ret- a retirement home basically and then they leave and they're not seen or heard from again mm. so i thought we could take a little direction with this which i will not reveal too much right now i'll lead you on to where i'm going with this and you mm-hmm. so they do that they said they take the money they sell up uh, they don't get much money i don't think they only get a few hundred it didn't because they were literally being handed dollar bills so it didn't look like they were getting like tens of thousands for you know so I don't think they, they're, they're suddenly super rich. So they move into this retirement home and they sign a contract for this very idyllic looking... They, 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 showed, they showed a leaflet, didn't they? So they've got a leaflet for a very idyllic looking retirement facility. Mm-hmm. So they get the contracts through, they sign them, and then they leave their property, sell it to the developers, and move down. Travel down to, I think, Jersey or something it was in, New Jersey, to this retirement facility. And they get there, and they realise that... It's actually not a standard retirement facility at all. What it actually is, is a top secret government research facility masquerading as a care home. Yes. So a little cross- <laughs> <laughs> Mine nice. doesn't follow quite the same route as yours, though. We're going to diverge now, but yes. Good. I like it's how it all just gone with giant organisations yes. pulling the strings in the background. There's a definite conspiracy theory theme. Exactly. <laughs> weird flying robots that can magically fix mm. things. There's some kind of weird shit going on. Yeah. Mm. Show. Also, 9-11 was an inside job and the world is flat. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Sid and Muriel realise that they've not read the contracts they signed thoroughly enough and actually what they've signed up for is to be guinea pigs in an experimental project to transfer the human consciousness into robots. Nice. You might see where this is going now. Yes. Mm. Still, they, even though they have not agreed to this before signing up, the 
people in charge of this facility reassure them that actually it's a great opportunity and they're going to be absolutely fine and in, re- in return for donating their bodies to medical science they have this chance to achieve eternal life basically because they're getting on in years mm-hmm. and by transferring their consciousness into a machine they could potentially live forever it's a bit of a black mirror John's kind of thing watching black mirror. yes it's very yeah, black yeah. mirror yes which is a well i go to quite often <laughs> there's a touch of the san Junipero's in this but just a touch mm-hmm. not, it's not mm-hmm. exactly the same so they're broke they've got no prospects they're tied into this contract anyway so they decide to take a leap of faith and go for it. And um, it's just such a weird situation. It's like, well, nothing else to do. I mean, we may as well just transfer our consciousness into some robots. Bizarre flying yeah. robot. Yeah. <laughs> we can have sex again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, in uh, a chimney. Yes. <laughs> so. Let's read your idea again. A little bit, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, only, only, only like a, one joke of it, but yeah. So the experiment is a success. Their consciousnesses are indeed transferred. Mm-hmm. But. What they don't realise is, of course, that technology in the 80s is nowhere near advanced enough. The 80s. <laughs> it's nowhere near advanced enough to come close to creating sophisticated humanoid robots. Oh, dear. So what they're actually trapped inside is these really cruddy-looking flying saucers, which, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. are the characters in the film. Also, the government completely lied to them about the level of aftercare once the transfer is complete. Mm-hmm. And they thought that once they were in these robot mines, they'd be able to live a life of luxury, etc. Actually, they are kept as prisoners and subjected to a, a number of quite painful experiments because they're mm-hmm. the, the first humans ever to be successfully transferred as robots. So, so they're basically test monkeys and bee pigs. Yeah. So obviously, if you haven't connected the dots, which I'm sure you have, they are the two robots from mm-hmm. the film, is mm-hmm. where I'm going with this. So there's a few scenes of them being, not, not too graphic, I'm not going too dark this week, but there's a few scenes of them being like tortured and experimented on, etc. And they're kept in like a lab in cages and stuff. Now I would like to point out, this is John not going too dark. No. And he, he's not wrong here. <laughs> yeah. Just like light torture. That's, a little light not, torture. A little light torture. It's not yeah, too dark for John. It normally, it normally goes much, much worse. So then the microwave gets opened. <laughs> um. <laughs> you have the cat in the comic? Yeah. Our, cat. our pub? Yeah, he microwaved that cat once. Only in a story. I oh my god. That's Only in a bleak. story. Like that specific cat. It made narrative like... sense. <laughs> uh, I might have to watch the episode. Which episode? It's is Gone that? Girl. The Gone Girl episode. Gone Girl. Right, okay. <laughs> I watched the film and then I technically it wasn't the, the cat from the chemic. It was a cat who happened to have the same name as our, as our local pub cat. Captain oh, right. is not a common name for no, a cat. No, obviously that's where my inspiration came from. I'm just saying it wasn't like I wrote our local. You pub and that cat story. have a long term feud that everybody knows about. Yeah, we've reconciled now. We got. I don't believe you have. Okay. You were not happy the, the other night when you was capturing bubbles or something. Oh, the okay, attention yes. was not on you. Deal, John's fish and chips. She, he steals like attention in more is more uh... the issue. He comes over, this won't be the podcast, but like, like all cats, they come over, they sit down and suddenly all the attention is on the cat. The conversation what just dies. a dick. It's just like, there's other things to talk about than cats. Like, yeah, we, we get it. You can lick your own balls. Good for you. Um, yeah, but it's not the same when a dog jealousy. walks in and you're like, oh my God, the dog, look at it, it's so quick. No, because it's dogs, are, dogs are darling. Fuck off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we'll talk about this later. Um, <laughs> meow. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> So, I've totally lost my train of thought now. So, yeah, they're being, they're trapped in this government facility being experimented on. And we see over the course of the nights when they are locked up together in, like, you know, some cages or something, they slowly start to learn how to communicate with each other again. Because they're non-verbal, obviously. So they have to learn how to communicate via a series of, like, bleeps and flashes and stuff. Yeah. I think this film might have to be subtitled for it to make sense, otherwise no one's going to have a clue what goes, what's going on after the first 10 minutes. <laughs> So we're going to have subtitles, but they're going to communicate via, you know, whatever. Oh, Sid, you look different. Yes, exactly. Yes, I do, Muriel. Yes. Yeah, exactly that. That kind of can really dynamic have, dialogue. Can you not have an overdub instead? Oh, you could dub them, yeah. That could be really funny. Hello. Yes. Or we can do robot, robot voices. Yeah. Uh, Liam Neeson would have to play the man, because he's got a good voiceover voice. <laughs> but slightly robotized, so it's like half Liam Neeson, half Stephen Hawking. Yes, that'd be good. Or, you, I, I doubt you could actually, I was going to say, bring in the third character who can translate for them. It's so like how... R2-D2, BB-8, and C-3PO oh. work. Oh, yeah, where C-3PO nice. just sort of explains everything mm. when he asks, asks a question. Mm. Well, okay, the reason that isn't going to work is, as you'll see as my plot moves along... Didn't they have a dog? Harry had a dog. Ah, oh, balls. Yeah, but as you'll see, the... I mean, we, we could learn that they talk, can, can talk to the dog. That wasn't something I considered. But the plot's about to intersect more clearly with the original film, and so there isn't a character there who translates for them, so that's why I've not done that. So it's probably going to be some time. I think we're slowing John down. We are, aren't yeah, we? Pay attention. <laughs> oh, pay attention. Sorry, sorry. Mm-hmm. Is going to win an Oscar one day. Um, <laughs> so, as I say, the, over time, the two of them start to uh, learn to communicate with each other again, and eventually they manage to work together to plot their escape. Mm-hmm. And we'll skim over how, but ultimately, you know, long story short, they do in fact get away. Mm-hmm. But they don't really have anywhere to go 
I think she mentioned having a grandchild, so I'm guessing they have kids, but let's say they're not close to them. The kids don't really talk to them anymore, and they're like, well, there's no point going back to them now with these weird, weird robot things. That's not going to mm-hmm. achieve anything. So instead, they decide that they'd better go back to Manhattan and check in on their old pals back at the derelict building. So, you know, they, obviously once they get there, which we see in the film, they appear at the window. And so this is me basically explaining where the robots came from because there's no explanation in the film. It doesn't really bother to yeah. explain it. So that's what this is doing. Mm-hmm. And well, why she they're so. around in phase clothes. Yeah, yeah exactly. To remind herself. Uh, of... Yeah, because yeah. they're all pals, yeah. Because yeah. I just thought, like, yeah, why would they choose this particular building? You know, the robots of everywhere in the world. So yeah. this is my reason because they actually they used to live there and these are their best friends and they're concerned for them. So they find their way back and obviously they see that things have gotten significantly worse already since they left because, you know, the restaurant's been trashed. Phase dementia is only getting worse. You know, there's broken pictures on the floor. But we also see that they're just beginning to gain an understanding of their own abilities, which as we have seen in the original film, mostly revolve around fixing things and absorbing various metal objects into their bodies and using them, you know, for any function they require. <laughs> So we're just going to follow the exact same story. What? Well, what's so far? Uh, just being dirty minded. Okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> Putting various objects. Inside. Yes, exactly. So, well, we'll come to that. So, oh, um, hello. So basically, <laughs> uh, we're going to follow the same story beats as the original film, but from the perspective of the robots. Because one thing I noticed from this film is, for a film about you know alien robots from outer space. They're not really in it very much. They're always kind of floating around in the background. Like it's all through the film. It's much more about the old couple and their story. So I'm just I thought let's give the robots more to do. So we're gonna see how they you know they clean up the diner, they, they renovate it, etc. They form that special bond with Jessica Tandy's character. Maybe she, as you mentioned in that whole classic film trope of the person with dementia actually being the person who sees everything what it really is. Mm-hmm. Maybe she actually figures out on some level who it is. Mm-hmm. And she just doesn't bother to explain to anyone else. But she's like, oh hey guys. Mm-hmm. So you know all that's happening, and they also figure out. Phil, you might enjoy this little detail. They Obviously, they have to plug themselves into the mains to recharge. Mm. But they realise that not only does this give them the power to keep going, it also, when given a high enough voltage, provides a very pleasurable sensation, quite comparable to the human orgasm. Ah. So, so they get quite addicted to that, and it makes them rather frisky. So. All right. Mm. How exciting. Yeah. And rather so, than falling asleep, they fly around the room yeah, like mad. Yeah, exactly, because I was like, yeah, they're just buzzing the tits off. So I was like, they do this, <laughs> this old couple who probably haven't... Like, like sex sleep. and cocaine. Yeah, exactly. I like this idea of, you know, this old couple who probably haven't... You know, their, their wilder days sexually have probably been behind them for a good while now. But they rediscover through getting all this juice from the mains and just, like, it awakens it all for them. Yeah, so over time, while they're, you know, doing all this, they re- rediscover their sex drives. And as you predicted, that means that they uh, they get it on. Yeah. I'm not saying that old people don't have, old couples don't have sex, but you know probably as I say at the point they were last human, mm-hmm. probably wasn't the peak of their sex lives, should we say? So now they're rediscovering themselves all over again, which I think is actually quite sweet and romantic as well as funny. But you know, yeah, like it's an old couple being given a second chance again, much like in Black Mirror, that episode of San Junipero, when it's the old woman and the woman who's um, par- paraplegic or in a vegetative state. And they get to go back and experience being young and being in love and that sex mm-hmm. and all that kind and of stuff. And they can put as much sex as they want in it because it's just two robots smashing together. Yeah, exactly. Kids so there's, there's no... Well, actually, as we find, that's not the case. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, there's going to be some <laughs> nice, very sweet scenes that are also quite funny of this you know, old couple rediscovering their you know, physical attraction to each other via these new electrically charged robotic forms. And they do get it on inside the shed that has been provided for them. And shortly after, Muriel discovers that she is in fact pregnant. Which, again, is wonderful for her because, you know, in her human form, that part of her life was long since over. So, you know, it's a real blessing. So they have the little baby robots. And again, we see more of the parenting from their perspective, how they raise them, you know, how the sadness on one of them appears to be stillborn. But then, hooray, Harry brings them back to life and it's beautiful. And it's just very nice. And so I'm I'm not going to hit every beat. So needless to say, the plot of the original movie continues to move along and all the things that happen in that film happen here. Mm -hmm. Sid gets attacked by Carlos, you know, Sid being the old man. Gets axed almost dies but then the children go missing but Muriel manages to repair him and Harry brings the kids back and they're all reunited and then the bit where the humans think that they're mad at them and are leaving forever actually what they're doing is they're realising they need to go and find more of their own kind because mm-hmm. like, they, they just realise that things can't go on the way they are at the moment things are getting quite bad so they go back to the government facility where they broke out of undercover obviously they don't go back and knock on the door and they, they kind of break in and sneak around undercover as though like yeah they're going to be wearing tiny little robot glasses and little wigs yeah, like. <laughs> <laughs> are they on top of each other and wearing a big trench coat or something yes yes exactly yes <laughs> hello we're here to deliver some robot parts yes they call themselves Vincent Adult Man 
<laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, they go back to the facility and they discover that actually since they left, dozens of extra old people have been tricked into the same thing mm-hmm. and are now being also being kind of tortured and experimented on in these new robot forms. This is the peak of the film. So they kind of, they manage to get messages out to these other robots and they basically form a revolution and they cause an uprising and there's all the old people in the robot spaceship things rise up and they break free they all get released and they're liberated and they burn down the facilities of the ground mm-hmm. so this will never happen to anyone else again and then they just all go back to Manhattan en masse and that's the scene obviously in the film when they come back with you know all the backup when you see there's suddenly dozens of all these robots mm-hmm. actually every one of them is just an old person who's been you know tricked into having their consciousness transferred and they all come back and save the day much like in the original film and so you know they rebuild the diner and happy ending great 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 and so credits roll end of film I was thinking maybe there's a post credit scene or a final scene mm-hmm. in okay. which we cut to some time in the future maybe present day maybe not I don't mm-hmm. know. maybe present day is too far because by that point the two old people are probably dead which is a bit sad I mean the Faye and the ones who aren't yeah, robots yeah. yeah but at some point in the future anyway we see that the robots have actually set up a very successful interior design corporation in which super wealthy <laughs> people pay for intelligent drones <laughs> to renovate their homes and it's been very successful and maybe like Frank it's and Faye it's already Fay's, a good tagline as well yeah well, I was thinking... my Intelligent is, drones, renovate your homes. Yeah. <laughs> Intelligent drones, renovate your homes. Well, yeah, I was thinking... Harry will be saying it in no time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was thinking... My, this whole idea came from... The, the first thing I thought of was to just do it as a TV series, or just as a version of Grand Designs, mm. where the robots just... Because there was a lot of renovation going on. So, uh, But then I thought I'd expand it a little bit. Uh, so, yeah. And maybe Frank and Faye, the human old couple, are the CEOs of this massively successful company, and now they're millionaires and everyone's happy. And that's the end of Batteries Not Included 2. Always read the small print. <laughs> <laughs> well good. Done. Very mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, it was really good. I feel like I was outclassed. Any on questions? Both fronts. <laughs> Any questions? Um, no, I think you wrapped it all up quite well. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. What happened to the other characters after the film? Oh, I guess they all got to work on this Grand Designs company. Ah, cool. Interior design. I like, suppose Mason could do the the designs. The marketing and the design. Robots, yeah. Like all yeah. The, Lyrid, lyrid yeah, I just wanted to give them a happy women. ending for everyone, and but yeah, because it's intersecting with the original film, there's nothing. They're having the same plot, so there's nothing yeah. extra happening afterwards, apart from this post credits. So it's all the same things happening to them. They're experiencing. Just I'm just showing it from the perspective of the robots. They so. could get an office on one of the floors of Lacey's building. Yeah, so the the, the diner could still be there as like <clears> a retro kind of you know. <clears> yeah. In the original film, did um, the Latino girl I've forgotten her name? Marissa. I think I was going to guess Maria, the most <laughs> common Marissa or Marissa or. <laughs> but did she have any hobbies of any kind other than just being pregnant? No, she had no personality apart from no. pregnant Latina lady. Yeah. Okay. And Mason just told her what's going on and what's going to yeah. happen and how she should live her life yeah. the whole time. Ah, cool. Yeah. Well, basically, her hobbies were um, creating shrines to strange men and stealing other people's property. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and being painted in the nude unawares. There's, there's a lot of thievery in this film. Yeah, there is definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, oh, yeah. should we get to the listener submissions? Yes, as I say, there were a lot this week. This Good. was a very popular one. Good so. choice, Phil. Yeah, on, behalf, on behalf of all the listeners, thank yeah, you. Yeah, you really struck a chord with this one. Well, so I'm going to start with the... There were a lot of plays on the title, obviously. So I'll start with those as hmm. some quick fire ones. They're always funny. So Carl Wonders, at Carl Wonders, said, Battery's not replaceable. Okay. Mm-hmm. Parleypod, at Parleypod. USB always inserts it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> She likes it that way. Yeah. What's her name? No. <laughs> uh, so, Paul Bauer said, dongle not included. <laughs> nice. Like nice. Harry's laptop. Yeah. Jack McCarter says, this charger does not work with this device. <laughs> Starting a theme here, obviously. <laughs> uh, Ryan Alexander, similarly, charging cable not included. Nice. <laughs> Jack McCarter, just blow on the cartridge. <laughs> 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 that was one of my favourites. Uh, Tyler Petty his idea was uh, the batteries were inside us the whole time Aww. <laughs> yeah. uh, Phil Catterall this charger is not supported uh, Joe Hermans Jim Henson's Chappie Babies so that's the film Chappie with, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so then for some actual sequel concepts uh, Nick Simpson said the same but with drones so I guess that's a modern take oh, great. Yeah. Great, we're done, yeah. Jason Ritterstein responded to that message with the same but with dildos <laughs> <laughs> What? How did, he, how, did, how did he come to that? Battery is not included. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. Disappointing porno. Mm. <laughs> I've never said those two words. Disappointing. <laughs> oh dear. 
Um, <laughs> similarly, soiled rest cinema at signals underscore of cinder underscore fury. Batteries included takes place in a sex shop. End of movie. So, <laughs> so that, that was a running theme, definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then some slightly more. Um, highbrow? Highbrow. Well, some slightly more fleshed out ones. So, Bill Tripp, his idea was the operating system causes early alien robot obsolescence to force us to buy newer alien robots when all along newly included batteries would have fixed the whole problem. Yeah. So I guess the idea is that, yeah, it's an Apple kind of thing where mm-hmm. if you just got some new batteries, it'd be fine when it's like a whole new product. <laughs> I don't know if this film is popular, people just use it as an excuse to bitch about Apple products. Brian Chamberlain, the obvious storyline is the little robots show up to a small down-on-their-luck entrepreneur who opens up a small tech repair shop. The robots turn the business into something super successful and the big tech companies try and bring them down since everything the tech companies build is made to fail. So again, very solid. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Carey said, "This time the batteries are included, and dot dot dot, they're rechargeable." <laughs> <laughs> Blockbusters. Their idea was just a title this week. Uh, batteries not included too. Wait, what side did we read again? <laughs> sure. And um, similarly, things I found online at Tifo Podcast. Batteries not included too. Please, just not the tiny round button ones. They're a real hassle. <laughs> And then we've got one that's actually somewhat more in depth. This is by Heavy Metal Horrorcast at HMH Cast, and it's called Batarangs Not Included. Okay. Do you know what Batarang is? Yeah. No. Wait, Wait Batarang is the thing that Batman throws. Yes. Like a ninja star. Yes. So. I always thought that Batarang was an actual thing and mm. not just Bat- one of Batman's things, mm. but uh, no, okay. Batarang's not included. Mm-hmm. Go on. So, in a state of penury after many bad deals and an economic crisis have left him penniless. Bruce Wayne must conduct his nightly vigilante escapades on a super budget. So he has to downgrade his utility belt, and eventually he has to resort to making the whoosh noise as his imaginary arsenal hits his target. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> so with Batman no longer the threat he once was, and he frank- because quite, he's making his own, he's sound, making his own sound effects, he's yeah. become a, pit, a pitiful, pitiful adversary. And the, the rogues of Gotham mm. have actually become quite bored because they, you know, they need an adversary. Why is what is the meaning mm-hmm. in their lives? Yeah. So. They actually start a Kickstarter to raise funds to restore the status quo. <laughs> and they actually give their nemesis a gift basket containing all his favourite crime-busting goodies mm. from his old kit. But Gotham's protector is slightly disappointed when he notices the Batarangs were not included. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> there good. we go. So yeah, those they, are us. They thought that through. That's they did, yeah. So some good, very good pun work this week, I think. Some good, good title jokes and puns. Yeah, thanks it? everyone. You've done us proud. That was a good one. So yeah, thank you, Phil, for choosing a very popular film. No problem. Uh, so yeah, those were our listener submissions. So thank you for submitting those. If you have any sequel ideas for Batteries Not Included or any films we've done in the past, let us know. We are Beyond the Box Set. You can find us at beyondtheboxset.com. Our podcast is available from all good podcasting platforms, including iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, and another new announcement. You'll appreciate this, Harry. What? We are now available on Alexa. So somewhere so- in the world, somebody is saying, Alexa, play Beyond the Box Set, and it will work. You've just wow. done it. You've just done it. So if they're listening out loud now, it will it's start. Just, it's just it's come on. Start, start the episode again. Or our, li- our listeners are going to massive. Alexa, keep, play keep Beyond the Box Set. <laughs> okay, Google, play Beyond the Box Set. <laughs> just get everyone to do hey, it. Hey Siri, play Beyond the Box Set. Would that work? Would Siri work? I don't know. Hey Siri, play Beyond the Box Set. Oh, oh, oh! It's doing it. <gasps> Quick question: sure. What's your favourite kind of? Do it again. We played our latest episode. Oh, I actually did it. If you want to get in touch with us, we're also available on most forms of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search Beyond the Box Set on any of those and you will find us. And next week... We'll well, be... before we get that, you've finished your other little bit there, we've also got merchandise on Tee Public. We do, yes. It's brand new, so fair enough that you forgot. Okay. I won't hold it against you. All oh, right, that's, <laughs> you say that, but that was quite passive aggressive. <laughs> yeah. So we've got merchandise just launched on Tee Public. Got T-shirts, mugs... Other stuff, I yes. don't know, whatever you can get on Tee Public. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> well, this. <laughs> and we've also just launched on Patreon as well. So if you do fancy giving us any money, it's a bit of an in- incentive for us to do this. I mean, it's incentive enough already, but um, we'd really appreciate it if you'd feel like being generous. Oh, and we have fabulous uh, bonus content that you get for your money. It's, there we go, it? that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, You're a fool not to. <laughs> yeah. So, it's my choice next week. Right. Let's do Snowpiercer next week then. Snowpiercer. Have you seen it? Nope. Chris Evans? I believe so, yeah. Maybe I'll finally start getting to my head what he looks like. Wait, sorry, you don't know what Chris Evans looks like? He's like, I keep forgetting. I know he's famous, but we I can't did Sunshine. Picture. I know, I still can't picture Captain him. Captain America. I just can't picture him. He's got a weird, weirdly forgettable face. Fantastic Four. A load of other shit. The ginger guy from Channel 4. 
No. No. Also, the other Chris Evans. I don't know who that is. See? Chris it's not just me. Egg on your face, Chris Evans. Captain America. No? Captain America. He's a very popular character. <laughs> People like him. His films make a lot of money. I don't know who that is. I'm getting angry. I shouldn't be. This is, just, <laughs> yeah. this is, this is not important. So Snowpiercer. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah, I guess. Is that about a boat? I think it's about a train. I've not seen it, but I've heard it's I've heard it's funny and silly, which is all things I enjoy in films. Funny so. and silly and Chris Evans. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sold. Great. Okay, Sounds cool. Like so, all right, ladies and gentlemen, tune in next week for Snowpiercer. Great. Cool. And thank you, Phil. Uh, is there anything you'd like to plug? No. No, nothing. nothing We've never had a guest yet who's really been into plugging themselves. No, no. I'm not that interested in plugging myself. Anybody at all. wants any guitar lessons in Leeds? Yeah. I'm or pretty busy at the moment, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> or not. Or if you're a podcast that wants a theme tune and you're willing to pay a lot of money for it, well, you won't not do it for a lot free. Of money. But some money. money. You won't yeah, do freebies yeah. on that. If you want a podcast theme tune, I'll do. Uh... And if if you are interested in that, actually, are you on Twitter? Uh, yeah, just Phil Hepworth. Yeah, or message Beyond the Box set on any of our social media channels and we will put you in touch with Phil. I also did the theme tune for Harry's my other... Old, my old podcast. Harry's beer, old podcast. Beer, pizza and a movie, which is still available yeah. everywhere on iTunes and I was, all that. I really enjoyed doing that theme Whereas tune. the Beyond the Box more, set one was a chore. No, 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 it was, it was a bit more classical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit more uh, film music-y. Hmm. And it had Harry playing trombone in it, which was funny. Yeah. If, if you want to get a taste for Phil's funny. range, it's very Sorry, funny. <laughs> in a great way. We had a great time. If, yeah, if, you, if you're a podcast or anyone who wants a theme tune for something and you're willing to pay some money for it, get in touch with us on our social media. We will happily put you in touch with Phil. He's very talented. So we would uh, recommend him. Very much. Yeah. Cool. So um, we'll see you all next week. For Snowpiercer. And thank you very much, Phil, for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank okay. you. And also thank you for playing us out live this week. Some films are fine, just the way they are Other films sometimes take it way too far But really how, how bad can it get? Let's go beyond Beyond the box set Beautiful